Erev Tov, I'm Stephen Benun. This evening I have a very special broadcast for you on about the end times here, the two witnesses, the Antichrist, etc. But before we start that broadcast, I just wanted to take a moment of your time and ask you to stand with us in support of this ministry, this prophetic news broadcast. We need your help more than ever. You could go to our websites, either IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. On IsraelReturns.com under contact, we also have our mailing address where you could mail a check to us in Europe if you so desire, if the Lord leads you. Or you can give securely online, either website, under donation, you can find a link there. We thank you for your support, and God bless you for standing with us here at Israeli News Live. Shalom. Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Special segment broadcast this evening on how close are we until the end. We've been watching the news broadcasts that have been happening around the world, seeing the wars and rumors of wars. We've seen all types of prophecies that are being fulfilled by the Pope of Rome, the Vatican, etc. And of course, the great question on many people's minds are how close are we to the end? I have a feeling we're extremely close. And in tonight's broadcast, I will be looking at the ministry of the two witnesses, mainly because the scriptural basis for the two witnesses that tells us how close we are to the end. So I trust that the broadcast will be a blessing. Uh, I do know that maybe there are some that tune in for news only, and uh, therefore it may not be as enriching for you, but I am sure for those of you that have followed this ministry for years, this news broadcast, it is definitely going to be an exciting next hour or so here that we spend together. We go right on into Matthew chapter 24, verse, verses 5 through 8. This is the very famous particular scripture of Matthew that Yeshua himself, Jesus himself, actually speaks about the ending of time and the things that we would look for, what we would expect to happen as the time came to an end. He says here, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes, in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So I'd have to say, friend, we are definitely in the beginning of sorrows, to say the very least of the hour we're living in. As he said right there just a moment ago in the scripture says, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. I am the Christ, the anointed one. This picture here, we took ourselves in uh, Vatican City about, oh, I don't know, eight, nine months ago, something like that now, the Pope Francis there as he was giving his speech there. And what's fascinating about it is, is that many shall come in my name, and this is exactly what the Vatican is. The Pope's down through the history, many have come in his name. They claim the name of Jesus Christ. They claim to be the ones that are bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many shall come in my name. Now, if you go back and look, though, and what he says here, I am Christ and shall deceive many. That's one thing we didn't want to forget. Those that come in his name deceive many. And of course, it's not just the popes of Rome that do that, which is something else we'll get into as we go into the broadcast here. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. 
We've had World War I, World War II, and we're just talking about the modern era. And I might add, when I speak about the modern era, remember what Yeshua said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and given in marriage. Unlawful marriage. Eating and drinking, according to the book of Enoch, they were eating human beings, and they were sinning against the animals eating their flesh and drinking their blood. And that just kind of sets a stage because in modern times, it is unbelievable the things that are going on in modern times. But it says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We are living in the last day here and like no other time in history are we seeing the wars and the rumors of war. Everybody is worried about World War III. Everybody's wondering, what's going to be the next major war? We have, right now, we have Kim Jong-un uh, claiming to have a hydrogen bomb. He's already got a nuclear bomb. Now he claims to have a hydrogen bomb. He does a test fire missile the other day off of a nuclear submarine, or off of a submarine. Uh, it does go successful this time around. The last time it was not successful. But this time around, he's successful. We have uh, Erdogan, the Turkish... Uh, uh, Prime, our president of Turkey right now, threatening he wants to be like Hitler and lead the world to a world, to, to the whole Middle East under his own occupation. You know, we're seeing Iran, we're seeing Saudi Arabia, we're seeing the kingdoms coming against one another. We see the United States and Russia. There is a threat of war between, and we say the United States and Russia, well, the U.S. is trying to drag in all the NATO powers to go with it to, 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 to make it look like the whole NATO force will go against Russia. We see all the Arabic nations against Israel. It's, it's, war, it's wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So the wars and rumors of wars, I would believe, is World War I. World War II. Those were the wars. Rumors of war was the Cold War era. Think about it. The wars and rumors of war. The Cold War was always a rumor that we're going to have World War III at any moment now. Then it goes to another thing that Yeshua says. For a nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is happening now. We even see conflicts within the nation, civil war. But the civil war is really nation against nation. The United States toppled Ukraine. The United States topples the Syrian government. It is one nation toppling another nation, kingdom against kingdom. Now we see Iran and Saudi Arabia going head to head, cutting ties with one another, threatening one another. Yemen also a war. Really, Yemen is a war between two kingdoms, between the Saudi and Iranian kingdom. One backs the other side, and they fight each other through, perhaps you'd call it a proxy war. Anyway, it's just <laughs> blows your mind away. <clears throat> now comes the, the next part of the verse that I find interesting as well. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, that just seems to be something that kind of covers the whole spectrum of the time frame that we're living in. We have been seeing massive earthquakes, we have seen floods, we have seen famines, and this has all been in the modern age that we're living in. So those things are certainly coming to pass. Let's move on into Matthew 24, verses 9 through 11. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and, uh, and shall deceive many. Hmm. Look, take a look at it a little bit of this, what he says here. They, you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. A lot of people believe that they're hated because they believe that Yeshua, Jesus, well, Jesus is the one saying it. So people are hated for the name of Jesus Christ, that they profess, that they believe in him. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. Now, that's an interesting one. 
Wish we had time to go into that there, but that's something that's pretty deep and it's very hard for many people to take. And they shall hate one another. That's within Christianity. That's really what that verse is speaking about there. And, and, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. The betrayal inside Christianity is one of the greatest betrayals I have ever seen in my life. And why? Because in one side to the other side of the spectrum in Christianity, they all take the name of Jesus, they all claim they have the truth, and yet they all hate one another if they differ in doctrine. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. We are definitely in that era now. The many false prophets that we see is very clearly, it's evident of the ecumenical move that is going on. I'm going to take you in that a little bit deeper here in just a little bit so you understand, because when we get into the two witnesses, you may be surprised there is a passage that speaks of this. Pope Francis sitting here with Kenneth Copeland, many other well-known evangelical people in the circles there. We also know about Rick Warren. We have Joel Osteen. All of these evangelicals who are false prophets promoting the Vatican. I don't want to say the Pope of Rome. Pope Francis is just one of the many popes. You could have another pope for, for, for all that matters. I really wonder if, we're, if, we're, if, if, if it's not at a point now where we'll even have time to get another pope. But there is still a possibility. There was a prophecy. I was trying to find it before coming on. It is from an apocryphal book that I could not find for the life of me. I've spoke about it before. It speaks about that king of the south that rises up. Uh, I would, if you happen to hear the video here and you remember where I got that from, please write me and tell me. Place it in the comments here. Write me an email at stephenvenoon at aol.com. Anything to bring this back to my memory where it was at. But it speaks about that the, there would be a king that would rise up from the south. And that king would bank, bankrupt the world economy with his Roman soldiers. But then it said after that, that's when the Antichrist comes. Now, I have wondered if that king of the south, some people might think, and I even suggested it could either be Barack Obama or it could be Pope Francis. They both come from southern hemisphere uh, places in their lives, their, their backgrounds. Uh, Barack Obama is from Africa, Pope Francis from South America, Argentina. But the thing is, the Roman soldiers is NATO's military. That's the Pope of Rome's military. It even says, goes on so much in that prophecy to say that he would take from the rich and he would divide the, 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 that, that money with the poor. And I'm just paraphrasing that. That's exactly what the Pope of Rome has been talking about doing. But the way it's worded in there is that the Antichrist follows this particular man. So it does leave a little window for me to believe that there could be one more coming after Pope Francis. Possibly. Can't say it's so, though. Matthew 24, verses 12 to through 14. And because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end. Notice that. He that will endure unto the end. The same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all nay, all excuse me, in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When does the end come? After the, this gospel has been preached unto all the world, unto all nations. See, all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Friends, that is no, that the only way this gospel that Yeshua is speaking about that gets rebrought back, it is not by the churches. It is not by the evangelical movement. It is not by the Catholic Church. It is not by any of these institutions whatsoever. Jesus himself knew that his words would be perverted. He knew that, 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 that the Catholic Church, even John knew it. He says that the Antichrist is all, he said they, they, so they went out from us because they were not of us. You see, so the Antichrist is actually a Christian, so-called Christian movement. 
John said the Antichrist went out from us. He said there are many Antichrists even in the world now, but he spoke about the Antichrist, the singular one that was to come. So it's going to be a Christian movement, so to speak. It'll be something like what we see at the Pope of Rome. What is he doing here recently? So many of you guys sent me the video there, the Pope of Rome, and he's, he's doing this wonderful peace video here uh, to, to bring all the world's religions together, and we all serve the same gods. At the very end, it's very interesting. They all hold in their hands their little emblems. One has the rosary, one has the little menorah laying in his hand, the other one has a little Buddhist statue in his hand. You know, and I thought to myself, oh my God, other than the menorah, every bit of it, pagan symbols. So when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Your two witnesses bring out that gospel. Okay? Now, that's when the end comes. The end will actually come. People want to know when the end is. The end comes when the two witnesses have fin finished their testimony. You know, as many times as I've done messages about the two witnesses, sometimes I forget, I'm not paying attention myself, but do you realize that every prophecy in the Bible that speaks about the two witnesses, at the end of their ministry, it's always the final end. The judgment of God pours out upon the earth with just a few remaining days that are there. This is why in Revelation 11, when you see the coming of the two witnesses, we find out that their ministry lasts exactly, what is it, 1,200 and I believe 60 days? Now, some analysts say, well, that's three and a half years according to the Jewish calendar of 360 days a year. Well, that's true. But then something goes wrong if you think about it that way. If you're comparing that to Daniel's 70th week and you say, well, there's, the, there's one week left to Israel. I do dif disagree with that. I believe there's only half a week left to Israel. I used to agree, though. I did. I have to admit, for many years, I thought as well that there was still one week left. But none of the early church fathers agree with that. And not even John Calver Calvin or, or, or any of the... Uh, theologians all the way up into the time of the modern era did it ever change that there was a full week left. Most of them believed it was either fulfilled completely or only half the week was fulfilled. Many of the Apocrypha books as well speak of half the week being fulfilled already when Christ died. And the, even is written there that he put the end of the sacrifice or to the sacrifices. So just a little thought I want to throw your way there. Now, let's take a look, though. Let's go right into this. This is in Revelation chapter 11. It says right here, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles." And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Friends, that is a simultaneous event. The same time that the Gentiles are given three and a half years, forty and two months, is the exact same time that is given to the two witnesses. It's not two separate times. If it were two separate times, and let's say it was based on a Jewish calendar 360 days in a year, and then you take these two statements right here and put them side by side, and then what do you have at the end? You have, an, you have exactly seven years according to a lunar calendar. But the problem is, is that the two witnesses are dead for three and a half days, their bodies raise up, and then judgment comes upon the earth, the angel pours out his vial. Then you go beyond the seven days. You go beyond the last week of Daniel that Daniel prophesies of. So something is wrong with that particular ideology. But I challenge this to you that what we see is when the temple is actually going to be the very signpost for you. When they build the temple or, when they're, or whether or not they start to build the temple or in the respect that they're given the outer court. The Gentiles are, and, they, they, and, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot for 40 and two months. Jerusalem. 
when this happens, and Rome takes control of this, remember, we find out in Daniel's prophecy that he'll come up strong with a small people. When what? Once he made that league, this is in Daniel chapter 11, when the, when the Pope of Rome makes the league, that prince that shall come, and by the way, you find that also in Ezekiel chapter 25 when it speaks of that, that wicked, Jew, or that wicked uh, Jewish prince, I believe is what it's called. Ezekiel chapter 25. Why is he called a Jewish prince? Because they gave the Pope of Rome an official seat right there at King David's tomb, making him the king of Israel, making him a Jew, so to speak. That wicked prince... Of Israel. See, you crown him a prince. That's what, the, that's what the Israeli government did. You crowned him a prince. But he makes a league, not a covenant. The covenant is the holy covenant. The holy covenant is the law of God that God established with Moses and that Christ came and restored it back to the way it should have been and not the commandments of man. See, because remember, friends, when I tell you this tonight, listen to me carefully, I'm not here to try to drag you into a bunch of laws. I don't believe in that. I'm not going to tell you to keep 613 laws. Jesus himself opposed that laws, those type laws as well. The only laws Jesus ever said, he said, think not that I come to destroy the laws and the prophets. What law? And Jesus tells you it was the Ten Commandments that he came to establish. Now, according to uh, the, the gospel that was, that was actually read by the early church fathers, Jesus says that there are 12 commandments. And if you look at Moses, Moses gave 10 commandments and two statutes. So there's your 12. All right. Now, anyway, so the two witnesses also prophesy at the same time. 1,203 score days, which is 1,270 days. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, keep in mind, you know, I see this. Actually, I think I used a picture uh, from that one little movie that was made by the Christian people there about Moses and Elijah, two old men. And I didn't use the part where they got fire coming out of their mouth. No, it's just like it was in the days of Elijah. When the king sent out the military to get him, he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. It's what he says will happen. That's the fire that comes out of the mouth. It's not that they're dragons. But God is trying to show you who they are by what the signs are that is given to them. Turning the water to blood. That's what Moses did. All right? Smite the earth with all kinds of plagues as often as they will. That's what Moses and Aaron did. A, another type of your two witnesses. All right? Now, let's look at this. Let's look a little bit closer now. But the court which was out the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Why do you think the Pope of Rome is pushing so hard for two-state solution? Even in Ezekiel chapter 35. Ezekiel 35, he says that Ezekiel prophesies and he's talking about Edomia, which is nothing but Rome. Read your book of Obadiah. Obadiah clearly attributes Esau as the Roman. And the reason why we know this, because he said you stood aloof, you know, while your brother was, was destroyed and and you were as one of them. And it calls him Esau the entire time. But what's he describing? He's describing the destruction of the temple at 70 AD when Titus, the Roman general, came down. And Titus was not by himself. He used the Syrian army to help him to do the battle. And what happened? Titus set, a, set aside while the Syrians did all the ransacking of Jerusalem. That's what Obadiah is speaking about. And God puts the blame on Esau. And yet, clearly, by the prophecy, you know Obadiah is speaking about Titus, the Roman general. Remember what Daniel says? Chapter 9, after he speaks about the anointed prince, which was Yeshua, and how the anointed prince, prince would be cut off at the, at the end of the 69th week, or after, actually it says after the 69th week. 
which means he was cut off in the middle. And what did he say? And the prince that shall come will be of the people, or, 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 or a prince shall come who will be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. The prince that shall come. That's your, that's your, that's your fake prince. That is your false prince, so to speak. All right, so he's given that, he's given that. It's given unto the Gentiles. And as you can see in the photo on your screen right here, you got Pope Francis here on the screen on the Temple Mount with all the Palestinians. There's your Gentiles. They want it. They're going to get it. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth, simultaneously, as I said. Now, I want you to notice something, though, in Revelation. And I just really pray that you guys are able to see these scriptures clearly. Revelation 11.4 states, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. All right? You, 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 you got to remember, go back. What do you say? All right? And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. I will give power unto my two witnesses. And then John tells you who those two witnesses are. They are the two candlesticks, the two olive trees standing before the God of the earth. Let's look it in and see what it says in Zechariah's prophecy because he's referring to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon, this, upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, then he said, he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, I know you guys know this. I mean, I, uh, hang on. I realize you guys are already aware of that. I know that you know because we read it right there in Revelation 11.4, these are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And he re he's referring to Zechariah. Anybody can cross-reference that and see it, right? No problem. But here's what you may not think about when you think about what the angel just said. He says, then said he, these are the two anointed ones. See? Now the angel tells you, just like John does, these are the two anointed ones that stand, stand where? By the Lord of the whole earth. Who's the Lord of the whole earth? Anybody know? Did we forget that Jesus Christ is the Lord? Not just of the whole earth. He's the Lord of everything. But he said that they stand there beside the Lord of the whole earth, and we know that Christ is that golden lampstand. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Revelation 11, 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing by the God of the earth. The angel just told you who they were. What did we have when Jesus came on, the, on Mount Transfiguration before the apostles there? And they saw, standing there with him, appeared Moses and Elijah on either side of him. They were the two olive trees standing before the God of the whole earth. You don't have to have a mystery about who the two witnesses are. Many people try to say it's Enoch. You know why they try to say it's Enoch? Because of the scripture in Hebrews chapter 9. Let's look at it then. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And everybody takes that scripture and totally ignore everything else that's written in that very chapter. Let's just look at a few of the verses. Verse 25. 
nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as, as it appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So how simple can we get? Appointed to die once speaks of Jesus alone. Look at the verse again in verse 24 and 25 only. So you get it. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. In other words, he didn't have to come into the temple after his death. He didn't go there. He went straight unto, into the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year. This is why the scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die. Why? Because it was not appointed for Christ to have to die every single, every single year or every single day. Every time you did something wrong, he's got to come back and die again. The passage has nothing to do with you as an individual. If it did, if it's a literal scripture, then Lazarus broke the word of God completely by the fact that Jesus Christ raised him up from the dead. He'd been dead four days. Four days rotten and stinking. And, and he raised him up from the dead and he died again. I thought it was appointed to man once to die. No, there's two times. No, there's three. But see, people base that and they say, well, uh, Elijah never died, so he's got to come back and die. The, the, the passage all here in, in the book of Hebrews, it has nothing to do with human beings. It was dealing specifically with Christ and Him alone. So, a little thought I wanted to share with you there. Now, let's move on. I want to take you into another beautiful type of the coming of the two witnesses. And this may, we'll be getting more into the ministry itself at this point here of what they're going to be speaking about as well. Remember Rahab the harlot. How many people remember that wonderful woman who hid the spies that Joshua, the son of Nun, sent in? That's actually where my name comes from, Benun. It's from Joshua's name. According to some of my own family, uh, distant relatives, I should say, it is, it is the, it, I'd have to call it a legend myself that we are the descendants of Joshua. Uh, it'd be nice to be true, but I can't say that that's really so. Anyway, the two spies... Uh, sent by Joshua to Rahab, or sent to, Re to Rahab, uh, uh, or they weren't actually sent to Rahab, but they were sent to spout the town, but they actually came to Rahab, who was recorded in the Bible to be a harlot. Now, we have this uh, recorded in the book of Joshua, uh, chapter 1, chapter 2. We also have it uh, recorded by James, uh, other apostles as well, always speaking about her being a harlot. But I thought what was really interesting, though, is that the two spies represent your two witnesses. Because if you'll notice, too, after Rahab hit them, when she sent, uh, sent them away, she tells them to go and hide for three days before going back. Now, the two witnesses preach three and a half years, or three and a half days. So it's still very interesting in how that works out. But what I think is fascinating is the fact that the two spies came to a harlot. And the harlot received them and as, a, as a receiving them and because of her love for them and not rejecting them or the message that they brought, God spared her and her entire household as a result. Who do you think the two witnesses come to in this day? If the two witnesses are coming to bring judgment upon Rome, and remember, Revelation 18.4 says, Come out of her, my be people, and be not partakers of her sins or her plagues, her sins and her plagues. See, I'm just paraphrasing. But if God is bringing plagues and the sins on the great whore, come out of her, my people, Revelation uh, chapter 17 speaks of the great whore, 
then the two witnesses then are coming not just to the Jews, friend. They are also coming to the Gentiles. Remember, Jesus said that this gospel must be preached into all the world, all into every nation. Then the end will come. Again, paraphrasing. We already spoke about it a little bit earlier. But do you realize that the two witnesses come to the harlot church today? To restore back the word of God. Bear with me as I share with this to you. Revelation 17, 1 through 6. And there came one of seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have, made, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations of filthiness of her fornication. Man, there's your communion cup that the Vatican uses. Uh, communion definitely has nothing wrong with communion. Yeshua told us to keep the communion, keep the Passover in remembrance of him. And this we do by the drinking of the, of the grape juice and eating of the unleavened bread, you know, and the washing of the feet. Amen. I believe in these things 100%. Ordinances that he laid for us. He says, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She gave birth to all these organizations. And even though there's many good people, even in the Catholic Church, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, whatever you have, and says, notice this, she's the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Abominations are what? The Islam? The Buddhist? I mean, some people say, well, Buddha was around before Islam was. But let me tell you something. The Vatican created the Islamic religion. Cardinal B proved that point. Now, she's the mother. How do we know she's the mother? Because all these organizations, all these churches are coming back to their mother and they're joining back up with the great whore of, of Revelation. I think it's Revelation 18 is where it calls her the whore. And she's the mother of the abominations, so Islam is joined back up with the Vatican. Even the Jewish rabbis of the Jewish Congress. Now, keep in mind, the Jewish Congress is not the Knesset. I had a precious brother send me an email the other day and was thinking I was referring to the Knesset. No, the Jewish Congress are rabbis from around the world that have made themselves a body called the Jewish Congress. That is who Rome signed a league with just recently. And the Bible says in Daniel 11, after that league made, he comes up strong with a small people. Now that the league is made with the Jewish Congress, guess what? Rome will become very powerful with the Palestinian Authority. And all you guys that are technical, please understand me. That are technical against the, the word usage of Palestinian. It doesn't matter. It really does not matter. For God's kingdom is not of this world. He's got a heavenly kingdom. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Yes. You remember Constantine when he helped organize the Catholic Church, put together their first state Bible, everything else? Then they went and made war, the Crusades, not just to kill the Jews, friends. They went there to kill all the early believers in Yeshua they kept the commandments of God. They murdered them. Anyway, the two witnesses are coming to the harlot Rahab of our day. According to Matthew 23, verse 34, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And you, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. You see, isn't that beautiful? John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. Why do you think the two witnesses 
will come to the harlots of today, the Rahabs of today. See, a harlot isn't always a bad thing. She just got mixed up. There's many, and I don't say that every Christian is a harlot. Please don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the system, the organizations themselves. That's what's evil. Zechariah sees this event as well. Zechariah 8.23 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. How do they, how do they find out that God is with... See, they, they take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, ten people of the nations. Remember, Jesus says that this gospel will go to all the world, to all the nations. The nations come because they hear God is with you. See, God is going to deal with the house of Israel, or soon the house of Judah first, according to Zechariah's prophecy. And when their eyes opened, this is what's going to start that revival. This is when those that have been trapped in the different doctrinal views and the denominational differences will realize that, oh my gosh, the two witnesses are here. We want to know. Tell us what the truth is. They're not going to take you back into 613 laws, friends. Zechariah 12, 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced or whom they have thrust through. Jesus' side was thrust through with a spear by who? The Romans. You know what's interesting? Both Jews and Gentiles were guilty of his death. Not just the Jews. You can't blame it all on the Jews. You see, the Romans were afraid that he would take over with the authority, but that's not what Jesus came to do. He was coming to set up. He, he knew that he was going to leave like this. But the Romans were guilty of his death. The Jews were guilty of handing him over because they did not like the gospel that he preached. They didn't like it when he loosed all the animals and let them go free and destroyed their livelihoods. That would be the same thing today. That's another reason why people hate the idea of vegan or vegetarians or whatever because they don't want to destroy the multi-billion dollar industry of killing an animal. Think about it. They look upon him whom they've thrust through or pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of uh, Had Hadramimon in the valley of Megiddon, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart, and the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. That's Orthodox tradition, friends. So those of you that condemn the Orthodox Jews, believe me, there's some Orthodox Jews that are going to end up believing that Yeshua is indeed the Messiah. It's what he says here. It's called by family names because they don't know what tribes they belong to for sure. Levi, Nathan, David, it's the house of Judah, Shimei, the house of Benjamin. We did some beautiful messages on the types of this from the, from the book of Kings where David is such a beautiful type. You should, guys, if you get a chance, go back and look those up. They're really wonderful messages. What is happening before Israel's eyes open? <laughs> what's going to happen before Israel's eyes come open? That's another interesting thing. As you see by the photo here, United Nations have Israel in the crosshairs. They definitely want to destroy Israel, if at all possible. Zechariah 12, 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto the people around about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. If you notice that, they're in siege against Jerusalem and Judah. And you know, that's exactly what we're dealing with today. Judah and Samaria and Jerusalem is where all the contention is. Do you know, the Palestinians don't even make that big of an issue over Tel Aviv or Haifa, any of these places. The big issue, even for the Vatican, is Judah, Samaria, or as we said, Judah and Samaria, and Jerusalem. 
This is where all the contention is. The people around then, when, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and Jerusalem. I want to make, uh, he says, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about. Because everybody wants it. The two witnesses come to both Jew and Gentile, as we've already stated here. Matthew 24, 14 proves this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. And as I stated, only the two witnesses can make that happen. I want to look a, bit, a, little, look a little bit next about Moses and the unfulfilled prophecies. In Exodus chapter 4, it states here, verse 8, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Now, just to kind of recap this for you guys that may not be aware of this here, if you go back into Exodus, starting in chapter 3, this is where Moses has come. He's met God at the burning bush. God has commanded him to take off his shoes. He takes off his shoes. He's amazed. He's meeting with God. One of the most interesting things that Moses does ask God at that time as well, he says, they will ask me, what is his name? What do I tell them? And then God answers Moses, tell them, I am that I am has sent you. All right? And... The funny thing is, I've always noticed that they never asked, nowhere can we find in the canon of the Bible that they ever asked Moses, what was God's name? So I've always held the contention that that's another prophecy that is unfulfilled. And only Moses will be able to answer that question. What is the divine name? Now, Zephaniah also in his prophecy said that when the, the nations are gathered against Jerusalem, that then a pure language will be restored to the people to be able to call upon the name of, as we say, Yahweh or whatever, but we know that's not the correct way. So that's a prophecy that's not been fulfilled. But then God gives Moses a couple of signs when he's getting ready to send them down. He turns his staff into a serpent. He takes his hand, puts it in his bosom. It comes out white as snow like leprosy, puts it back in, brings it out, and it's restored again whole. Those miracles there. But this one here in verse 8 is one that most people overlook and never think about. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, they that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Now, the voice of the sign and the physical two signs that God gave Moses are not the same. And that's why most people miss this one right here. Now, see, what are we doing? We want to establish unfulfilled prophecies about Moses because it also reaffirms for you not just the fact that we say, uh, you know, it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment and then show you that that's speaking about Jesus it has nothing to do with the fact that, uh, that uh, Enoch and Elijah have to come back. That's totally false. We've already proven without any shadow of a doubt by Zechariah's prophecy, by the book of Revelation, those two witnesses are the two that are standing by the, by the, by the God of the earth, by the Lord of the earth. And in the vision where Jesus stands there on Mount Transfiguration, on both sides of the Lord of the earth, stand Moses and Elijah. There's your prophecy. There's who your two witnesses are. But we have more scriptures that can prove who they are. This is another example. God says to Moses, It shall come to pass if they will not believe you, neither hear or hearken to the voice of the first sign. His voice is that sign. In other words, whatever Moses says comes to pass. And if they don't believe that, God says they shall be, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Whoa, wait a minute. You know, it's almost, you know, if you're not paying attention, it's as if you make God schizophrenic. God's saying, okay, they may not believe you now, but they're going to believe you later. God knew they were not going to believe Moses the first time. Let me prove that to you from David's writings. David tells us Israel did not believe Moses at all. We find that in Psalm 106. Therefore he said that he would destroy them that had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. What was it? If they don't believe the voice of the first sign. 
if they, see, if they will not believe you, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. What did he say there? They believe not his word. Verse 24. But murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Moses was the voice of God to them. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. Mm. Pretty tough. Yet God prophesied to Moses that he will return. He's going to return Moses. We find that in Exodus 34, verses 10 through 14. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. It's not the word marvels is the wrong translation. It's wonders. Such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. Observe that which I command you this day. Behold, I drive out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the, per the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether you go, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other god. Wait a minute. Moses knew before this prophecy was ever get, given, he was not going into the promised land. He said it publicly. He said it publicly in the book of Deuteronomy. Right after the breaking of the, right after the giving of the Ten Commandments off of Mount Horeb, he said that God's not going to let me go into the land because of you. So what's this here? And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people, thy people, I will do wonders such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. He's not talking about the children of Israel there. And as the rabbis have even said, the sages, everyone that has ever talked about the scripture, that's why they changed the word to marvels. He said because he couldn't do any great, there was never any greater wonders. There was never some terrible thing that ever happened like the splitting of the Red Sea or the great judgments of God. See, the thing was that you, my Jewish brethren, you didn't have the book of Revelation. You didn't have the prophecies of, uh, of John that spoke of the coming of the two witnesses. Well, you did, but you didn't quite understand what they were. Daniel didn't even understand it. Daniel had no idea that he was prophesying of the two witnesses. In fact, in the book of Daniel is where the same word in Hebrew is used there. I'll just show you real quick. That word, you see it underlined here. I know you guys don't understand. Nipalat. Okay? This, the, the, if you, to, gosh, I don't know how you guys see it on your screen. Anyway, right to left is how Hebrew goes. The one that underlined, nun pe lamet alef tav. The pe lamet, lamet alef is the root of this word right here. That's the word that means wonders. And that's the exact same word that God uses with Moses in Exodus 34 as he does in the book of Daniel when Daniel, the, the man, one of the two men that asked the one that is standing up on the, above the waters and says, how long do these wonders are they going to go on? And what does the, uh, the, the one standing on the water say or above the waters, which is none other than Jesus? For times, time and a half time, three and a half years. My gosh, friends. This, I know it's long. Please forgive me. Bear with me, though. This is very important. Very important that you guys hear this. You don't, I'm telling you, you're not going to want to miss the end either. You really don't want to miss the end. But Moses already knew he would not go to the promised land of Israel. See? We find that out in Deuteronomy, the first chapter, verse 37. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Amazing. See, he knew he wasn't going. 
The message that Moses will bring is a message of restoration. The two witnesses bring a, a message of restoration. It says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and to, and to judgments which I teach you. For I do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto, unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Question is, is what did Moses command? What were those commandments? And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them upon the two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land, whether you go over to possess it. Now, when you actually look, and you can go back, read Deuteronomy from chapter 1, go all the way to chapter 6, I believe is where it is, you will not find anywhere there was ever given more than Ten Commandments and two statutes. In fact, when he was completed in doing this, and I, I'll just read it to you real quickly, he literally says, do not add anything else to it. That was it. It was done. That is in chapter 5, Verse 22, he completes it. He says, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. These words the Lord spoke unto all your assembly in the mount of, uh, at the, out of the midst of the fire, uh, the fire of the cloud and the thick darkness, and great, with a great voice, and he added, No more. He wrote them on two tables of stones and delivered them unto me. He didn't add anything else. Why then do we need to add something to it? Jesus speaks the commandments as well. Let's just look at what he says. Because you know, that's why I say, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, because people say, oh, Jesus, is, it's grace only. We're no longer under the law. Let's see what Jesus says. I, I pulled up, what is it, three, four, five, six verses here that Jesus speaks about this. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's right from Moses' Ten Commandments. Jesus answers him and says that. Luke 1, 6, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Luke 18, 20, Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus is not giving you the 613. He's only given. Because see, what was it? That was the rich young ruler that asked, Lord, what must I do in order to receive eternal life? He said, you know the commandments. He said, yeah, I did this since my youth, but what do I lack? He said, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor because he knew he had, he had great abundance. In other words, share. Share what you have with those that are in need. You know, and one of the apocryphists, he actually says to him, he challenges this same, the same story when he started to go away dis disappointed. Jesus challenged that rich young ruler. And he said, and you say you have kept the Ten Commandments? He says, yea, you have not. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Lionel Parkinson made a good comment about that not long ago. He said, said to me, he says, what commandments is John talking about? Jesus has his own commandments. He says, what are they? 1421, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will, and will manifest myself to him. John 15, verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Now we go into the apostles. John speaks of it here. And hereby we know that we, that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, 1 John 2, 4, He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John, 1 John 5, 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Again, I'm not giving you Levitical law. 
I'm not, that, you know, Levitical law happened because the people, the, the children of Israel rejected the commandments of God. They wanted a whole bunch of rules and regulations. God's not into the rules and regulations. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and your house shall be saved. And if you truly believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will also keep his word. All right? Revelation 12, 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's pretty good. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. See, they go hand in hand, friends. And there's more there. You can read them yourself. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not, excuse me, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But, he, but, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now you see, see friends, now I'm not talking, like I said, we're not talking about the Pharisaic commandments. We're just talking about thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Anybody that tells me, you know, Brother, we, we don't have to keep the commandments. Oh, then you can go ahead and you can covet, you can kill, and you can commit adultery and all that too then. Okay, this is, but this is, what the, this is what your witnesses are coming to do, is to get the people back on the word of God again, friends. All right, Moses and Elijah will not teach commandments of men. See, Mark 7, verse 6 to 10, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Notice, they lay aside the commandment of God and take the traditions of men. That's where, like the rabbis today, you know, you got to have a beard, don't cut the corners, don't cut the sides. Remember what little Nathan said in the vision that he saw? He said, God's not going to care if you wear a kippah. God's not going to care whether or not you have a beard. The Messiah doesn't care about these things. Those is what he's talking about. And he said unto them, full well you reject the commandment of God that you keep your own tradition. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother, and whosoever curses his father and mother, let him die the death. Mm. Jesus prophesies of Elijah's return as well. Let's look at that one as well. And the disciples asked him, saying, When then say the scribes that Elias must first come? That's Elijah, Greek for Elijah. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. So something definitely gets out of cater, doesn't it? But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Now, the prophecy of Moses returning is right here. We find it in Exodus chapter 15, verse uh, 1. Then sang Moses and the, ch uh, and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted, and the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now they all sing the song, but if you'll notice, the rabbis even comment on this where he says, I will sing, Asherah, Ladonai ki ga'o ga'a, sus verekevo rama beyom. It's Moses, singular, one man that sings, I will sing that the Lord has triumphed, actually the right way to say it is triumphed gloriously, and he has taken his horse and his rider and cast him into the sea. This is Moses coming to deal with the Antichrist. If you notice, it's kind of interesting. Elijah seems to deal with the restoration of the word. Moses deals with, I guess they kind of interchange because they both got judgment qualities in them regardless. But anyway, in this case here, Moses is bringing the judgment on that Antichrist rider. The horse and his rider, Revelation, the horses, the four horse riders there. Moses comes to deal with that guy. All right. Getting close to the end now. Malachi 4, verses 4 to 6. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded in him and Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Isn't that interesting? Here we are, speaking, speaking, fixing to talk about the coming of Elijah. And what does Malachi say? He brings you back to Horeb. 
for all Israel. Isn't it interesting? It doesn't speak of Mount Sinai, but it speaks of Mount Horeb. If you look in the book of Deuteronomy in the first chapters, first, uh, chapter 1 through chapter 5, this is exactly where Moses speaks about coming off of Mount Horeb with the Ten Commandments on the stones and the statutes and judgments and added no more. And Malachi tells you, remember my servant Moses, which I commanded to him at Horeb for all Israel. You're seeing a beautiful type of Moses and Elijah together in the book of Malachi chapter 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. When does they come? They come right before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, Jesus does apply the heart of the children or the fathers to the children to John when he came. And the, the, the heart's desire of the fathers was the coming of the Messiah. And yes, John does introduce the Messiah to the children. And they rejected it. But at the last part of the coming of Elijah, which he does not apply to John, the heart of the children to their fathers, this Elijah comes to, to Israel and gets them to recognize that Yeshua was indeed the Messiah after all. Notice the timing also, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. According to Obadiah chapter 1, which is only one chapter, verse 21, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the mount of Esau, and the kingdoms shall be the Lord's. Wow. After the mount of Esau is judged, then the kingdom returns back to God himself. Fixing to get into the timing now. I want you to really watch us closely as we finish up these last few panels here. Daniel sees the two witnesses. We see that already in Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 to 7. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, three stood on, uh, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand and to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it should be for times, times and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Wow. What here? And the kingdom shall be the Lord's when? Once judgment comes upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Times, time and a half. According to Daniel chapter 4, time represents a year. So it's three and a half years. Also what happens? Scatter the power of the holy people. That's your Antichrist. Remember what I said earlier? According to Revelation 11, they're working simultaneously. The same time the two witnesses are working, so is the Antichrist to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished at the end of that three and a half years. And he also asked, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Remember what I said to you about Moses. Exodus chapter 34, verse 10. I, God prophesies that he'll do wonders with Moses. Not marvels, wonders. There it is, Daniel. Now see, Daniel doesn't know what's going on. Now, let's go back to Revelation 11. After the two witnesses are killed. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. Remember what he just said in Daniel here. See? Times, time, and a half time. That's three and a half years. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. So there again, another type. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and tenth part of the city fell. And the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. In Revelation eleven fifteen, this is when judgment has come. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. When does that happen? Right after the death of the two witnesses. Actually, 
That's the second woe. The third woe cometh quickly, which happens for about the space of 10 days, is the third woe. But while that's going on, that angel sounds out right after the death of the witnesses. That the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. All right? What, did, what, did, what, what happened over in Obadiah? And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. After what? After the Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. So keep that in mind, the Mount of Esau being judged. All right? Now, kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Now let's look at Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. What mystery? Daniel chapter 12 is that mystery. When, the, when does the seventh angel begin to sound? After the death of the two witnesses, after their resurrection. That's when the seventh angel actually begins to sound. And when he begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. What? In other, what does that mean? In other words, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 12. And I heard, but... I understood not, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. See, Daniel was told to seal up the book until the time of the end. He wanted to know, he didn't understand what these two men were on either side of the bank of the river. He didn't understand what it meant when they said, How long will Lord till these wonders be? And then the Lord said, For a time, times and a half time, which is three and a half years. Daniel didn't understand that. So it confused Daniel. And so he was totally blown away by this. But the mystery of God should be finished according to Revelation 10, 7. At the voice, when the voice of the seventh angel shall begin to sound. What is the seventh angel? The seventh angel sounds in Revelation 11, 15. Sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. You see, friends, how beautifully the scripture ties together? It is amazing. Now, let's look at Revelation 11. Go back. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. And we're, we're backing up now. Two witnesses. I just wanted to show you the end real quick, but now we've got to back up to show you what happens here, the final parts of the judgment. Ascended out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, your two witnesses, and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That's Israel. And they of the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Mm. This is a very critical scripture that you've got to see next. The death of the two witnesses brings God's judgment on Rome. Like I said, friends, it, their reign, the Antichrist and the two witnesses, are going to go side by side. Because according to the Bible, after the death of the two witnesses, the Bible clearly tells us that the, kingdoms of, the kingdom of God goes back into his Christ. According to Obadiah, the kingdom returns to the Lord. After what? After the judgment of Esau. And so we see the death of the two witnesses. The seventh angel sounds. The mystery of God is finished according to, to Revelation 10, 7. When the angel shall begin to sound, the mysteries of God should be finished. As he had declared to his servants the prophets. Well, I know Daniel speaks of those mysteries. And that mystery was of the coming of the two witnesses and their ministry. All right? Now, we just found out that, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, what? At the death of the two witnesses. So let's see what happens in Ezekiel chapter 35. Because thou hast said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine. He's speaking of the dividing of Israel into a two-state solution. And we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there, showing that Christ was there, Yeshua himself. That tells us it's Israel. It's Jerusalem, actually, in fact. 
dividing of Jerusalem. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thy envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them. Talking about the Jews. When I have judged thee, judged who? Esau, Rome, Adam. Okay? And thou shalt know that I am the Lord and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. As thou did rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, Obadiah, the whole book of Obadiah clearly shows that they were rejoicing over the destruction of the house of Judah. And that's what he brings out. The house, of, see, as thou didst rejoice in the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Edomia, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So when the whole earth rejoices, and the only place we have scripturally that tells us the whole earth rejoices is at the death of the two witnesses. And that's also the same time that God brings the end to Rome. The Antichrist in his reign will cease. And that perfectly then lines up with the scripture that speaks about the mystery of God should be finished. That mystery, Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, after the seventh angel sounded, according to Revelation 10, 7, then the great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Friend, you're at the closing hours of all humanity. We started off this broadcast talking about Matthew 24, where Jesus said the signs of things that would happen. Nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. These were the beginning of wars and rumors of wars. As we said, wars and rumors of wars. World War I, World War II, and the Cold War era is the rumor of wars. Nation rises up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's what's happening right now. The Saudi kingdom and the Iranian kingdom rising against one another. The Turkish kingdom, the nations, the United Nations fighting against other nations, Russia, the threat of war between them, all the little small nations, they're going up against each other. Prophecies are being fulfilled, friends, constantly before your eyes every day. You see, all these things here are what happen, and at the same time, right at that time frame, Jesus said these were the beginning of sorrows. He speaks about the famines and the earthquakes in diverse places. That was as a whole. That encompasses the entire age that we live in. But what's going to happen now, what we're on the precipice of now, are the coming of your two witnesses. At the same time, your Antichrist will rise on, to, on the scene as well. It's a showdown between them both. Remember, according to the prophecy, and I believe this is Obadiah's prophecy. Let's see where I can find it for you just real quick here. Um, in Obadiah, yes. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. It's a three and a half year judgment. This, the key sign to all of this seems to be the building of the third temple. He was given a reed likened to a rod. He said, measure the temple, measure the altar, but leave out the outer court for it's given to the Gentiles and they shall tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and two months, three and a half years. Then he says, and I give power unto my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days. We're at that closing hour. If you do not know Yeshua to be your Savior, I encourage you with all of my heart that you seek Him with all of your heart and know Jesus Christ to be your Savior tonight while there's still time. And let me tell you something, even when the two witnesses come, there's going to be time, friends. Jesus says this gospel has to go to all the world, to all the nations, then the end will come. I do believe that the church sees 
as I showed you, a proof. The two spies, a type of the two witnesses, they come to the harlot. But she receives them gladly. That true believer will receive them gladly, as we saw the ten, the ten people of the nation shall take hold of her, the skirt of him that is a Jew. Show us what the truth is, is really what we should be looking for. Believe Yeshua to be your Messiah. Believe these two witnesses when they come. And they will direct you back not to 613 laws. But they will teach you to keep the commandments of God that he laid down. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The Lord thy God is one God. The simplicity of God's laws that God gave Moses. Thank you for watching this evening. And we encourage you, be a partner with us in this ministry. We need your support. There's much that we're about to do. We're about to, again, go on the road, not for family matters, but for the purpose of ministry and news and coverage as these great things of God are going to be breaking here in the last days. We will be on the front lines to cover things for you. This is why we live where we live. We will be going to the refugees to see the refugee camps, the Syrian refugees, the different refugees from the different war-torn countries. We'll be going back to where the great whore lives. We'll be bringing you everything we possibly can. We need your financial support to make that happen. And I know we're in a late hour, and I know financial situations around the world are a very big issue right now. But if you really want to support something that is true, because many of you believe that what we do is straight from our heart, not to be someone, stand with us, support this ministry, you can give online at israelreturns.com or israelinewslive.org. At israelreturns.com, under contacts is our address. I will include that also at the end of this broadcast. We thank you for your love and support. Pray for us. We will be praying for you as we enter in this final stretch of going home to be with our Lord and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Stephen Benoon. You have been watching Israeli News Live, our prophetic segment.